Okay, and what we want to do in this video is have a look at the goals of monetary policy. Now, in a previous video, we had a look at the role of central bank, what the central bank is trying to do. And essentially, these are really, really um, um, entangled and intertwined. But what we're going to look at now are essentially the five goals. What is the central bank trying to achieve by engaging in monetary policy. So again, a few quick definitions which we've already seen before, but it's never any harm to remind ourselves of exactly what we need to know. The central bank is the government's bank, and it's the institution that is responsible for enacting monetary policy. And what monetary policy is, what the central bank does is monetary policy, is a demand side policy using changes in the money supply or interest rates to achieve economic objectives relating to inflation and unemployment. Okay, so that's what the central bank does. That's what monetary policy is is. Now, again, just to remind yourself, and I, I know just going back to this previous slide here, um, it says um, money supply or interest rates. What we will see in later videos, and I'm intentionally leaving the difficult stuff until the end, so that we have a, an intuition, a, an, an intrinsic idea of what the central bank is doing. But what it does is it changes the money supply, Changes in the money supply change the interest rates. Changes in interest rates change aggregate demand. And changes in aggregate demand can be used to achieve an economic objective. And usually the main purpose of the central bank, and I'll repeat this over and over again, is to control inflation. Okay, But um, it can also be used, as we will see here, to affect uh, unemployment as well. Okay, now what we've got here is the first goal of monetary policy is low and stable inflation. And I will repeat myself over and over again throughout these slides. The primary role, as I've already said, of most central banks is to create an economic environment where uh, economic growth can occur. And that literally means low and stable inflation, hence I repeat this here. Now what are we talking about when we're talking about inflation? A sustained increase in the general or average level of prices and a fall in the value of money. Now, what we are saying here is that if the, on average the price of all goods are rising, so if there's 100 goods in the economy and on average the price of 90 of them are rising and maybe even 10 of them are staying the same or you know, a few of them are falling, but on average the price of an entire basket of good is rising. That is not a problem in and of itself if it's low and stable. If it's not like, you know, from one day to the next, there's a 100% increase in price. I mean, that would really be worrying. Or that it goes, uh, inflation is positive one day and then negative the next. That's very, very difficult for entrepreneurs, which are the drivers of a capitalist system, a driver of the economy, to make intelligent economic calculations regarding price, the value of money that they pay for their input costs, all of that. So what we need is low and stable inflation because if it's low and stable, let's say 2% or so, that means that entrepreneurs, those people that bring together the factors of production to produce the goods and services that you and I enjoy, um, can plan better. And if they can plan better, well, they will make more intelligent decisions. And if they make more intelligent decisions, the economy should do better. Now, forgive me, I digress. So in order to foster economic growth, as I've already said, inflation must be low and stable. Printing money causes inflation. So the central bank must be sure that there are no sudden large increases or decreases for that matter in the money supply. Now, um, in order to achieve this, is another definition coming up. Um, many central banks engage in what is called inflation targeting. So I keep on saying about 2% or so. So inflation targeting is where the central bank uses monetary policy, changes in money supply, to change the interest rates, to change aggregate demand, to achieve an economic objective usually to do with inflation or unemployment. Um, to uh, the central bank uses monetary policy to maintain inflation close to an agreed target, usually around 2%, by constantly adjusting the money supply of an economy, which in turn adjusts interest rates, which in turn adjusts aggregate demand, the central bank has the potential, and I will stress that the potential, to control inflation or keep it close to that 2% target. Now, many of you may um, believe that, like, or may think, well, why would you want any inflation at all? Inflation in and of itself has certain advantages, um, most likely um, get people spending today, which is an effort to try to keep aggregate demand um, um, rising, I suppose, because if you're constantly 
saving your money, well then that money that you're saving, assuming a 0% interest rate, will constantly lose its value. All right. So I won't go through all the previous slides, but we have seen this slide over and over again. So we're talking about controlling, the, reducing the money supply in order to keep inflation low and stable. Now, it can happen that they want to cause a bit of inflation, uh, and we'll see that later on. So what we've got here is our LRAS, our AD, and our SRAS. As we can see, the economy is producing a level of output which is unsustainable given our current level of factors of production. The central bank once inflation is a problem because what we want here this is where the aggregate demand should be and that would uh, well, there uh, and that would um, lead us back to a sustainable level of economic growth with a lower rate of inflation so right now the economy is overheating we're producing beyond what is sustainable and inflation is the problem so what does the central bank do well the central bank reduces the money supply again you don't know how it does that yet and I'm saving that for later videos what does that do Bank it causes banks to increase their interest rate, which means that savings rises and consumer uh, consumption falls. That causes uh, consumption to fall, C in the AD um, equation, and that causes aggregate demand to fall. Also, the cost of borrowing rises, less investment projects are now profitable, so investment falls, which again causes aggregate demand to fall. Also, the currency, um, well, it's not really revalued, I mean, it's, it's devalued, should we say, um, which causes net exports to fall, which also causes aggregate demand to fall. What we are saying here, therefore, that all of those three parts of the um, aggregate demand equation combined with the multiplier hopefully would bring us back to the sustainable long run level of output, which is YFE, not forgetting, of course, that um, you know this can shift outwards. Okay, so that would be the desired effect of a contractionary monetary policy um, designed to bring inflation under control. All right, now the next thing here is long-term growth. Well, we have already said that they want to keep inflation under control to create the economic conditions that allow for long-term growth. And how does low and stable inflation cause or allow for long-term growth? Well, if prices, which are the coordinating mechanism, the things that bring demand and supply together, are not changing drastically and rapidly, well then that will allow entrepreneurs to make intelligent decisions. And the more intelligent decisions that they can make, the more more likely economic growth is. Okay, now what is the definition of economic growth? The growth of the real value of output in economy over time, usually measured as a growth in real GDP. Um, and as I said, through careful management of the money supply and therefore interest rates, inflation can be controlled and real GDP has a stable environment to grow. I hope, I hope, I hope that makes sense. So um, the goals of monetary policy thus far have been low and stable inflation and long run economic growth. Now, low unemployment. Okay, now this is in very, very important, economically speaking. And I, I, and I don't ever lose sympathy for somebody that has found themselves unemployed, um, as I'm sure it's a horrible thing. But just speaking about, so I'm, 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 I'm not ignoring that negative aspect of it, but I am just looking at the economics. So economically speaking, Unemployment is a waste of scarce resources. Everybody has something to add. And if we could just find a way to, to, to get people that are looking for a job, seeking a job, work, well then we all would benefit from the increased production and as such increased consumption in society. So to de define what I've already said, unemployment, the state of being eligible for work, actively looking for work, but without a job. All right, that is a waste of scarce resources. So if I can bring you back all the way, and I got this from the Intelligent Economist, um, this production possibility curve, if I can bring you back all the way to the introduction, if we have unemployment of any of the factors of production, okay, land, labor, capital, and enterprise, but let's just say we're talking about labor. If we have unemployment, we are producing an inefficient point within the production possibilities frontier or production possibilities curve. If we could find a way to get these people that are actively looking for work, seeking a job, eligible for work but can't find it, if we could get them employed in, in useful employment, then what could happen is the total production in society could increase here. So in this example, it's food and clothes. I mean, that's arbitrary. You can write goods and services if you want. But we could have more of both um, goods and services. And that w if we produce more, that means we can consume more and as such have a higher standard of living. Just to show you a bit of what we call uh, cyclical unemployment, 
this is uh, unemployment in the economy where this is what we're capable of producing and therefore consuming but we're only producing this amount it is a waste of the economy's scarce resources and we are suffering all of us on average a lower standard of living because people that are eligible for work looking for work but can't find a job and and if we could find a way to get those people in in, in employed in, in in effective efficient work we would all have a higher standard of living and again as I said I am constantly going to repeat myself so national income as such as a result okay um, of unemployment is lower so national income usually the standard of living in the country would be higher if more people were engaged in efficient work all right as the central bank can affect aggregate demand through changing the money supply which changes the interest rates which changes aggregate demand and therefore can change bring about um, a desired outcome in the economy and um, they can create a situation in the short run now where they can cause aggregate demand to increase and as such for a time anyway cause unemployment or employment to increase unemployment to fall so again I know we've seen this but it's over and over again I'm just trying to um, uh, kind of reinforce this a lot um, if these if the central bank prints more money that means that they are enacting an expansionary monetary policy so again we've got our long run average uh, aggregate supply curve our aggregate demand curve and a short run aggregate supply curve and we can see here in this situation what we have is a recessionary gap all right we have cyclical unemployment in um, this model here, this scenario. So what can the central bank do? Well, the first thing they can do is print more money. Now again, they don't really just print it. There are, well, I mean, they do, um, but there are three main tools which we'll come to in a later video. So remind yourself now, when I say print more money or reduce the money supply, what we're gonna do is we're, you should refer yourself to the tools of monetary policy video, um, which explains how to do it. And I will bring all of that together in a, in, in a later video uh, anyway. So they print more money, just for argument's sake, that's what they do, they increase the money supply. Banks then lower the interest rate because they have more money to lend out in the profit maximizer. Savings fall because the reward to saving has fallen and consumption rises because if you're going to save less, you're going to spend more, so therefore aggregate demand rises. Um, the cost of borrowing falls, therefore more investment opportunities have become profitable and therefore investment rises, which also cause aggregate demand to rise. And then finally, the currency devalues and net exports rise because exports rise and imports fall and therefore aggregate demand demand rises again. All of these three elements of the aggregate demand equation combined with the multiplier effect would lead aggregate demand to shift outwards. And then hopefully where we find ourselves is at the very least closer to, if not at, the full employment level of output, which is YFE. Now, it doesn't mean there's no unemployment. All it means is that there's no cyclical unemployment. There is uh, frictional and structural unemployment, but still we are producing at the sustainable level for our um, uh, factors of production in the economy. Now, on to number four. So number one, if I can remember myself, was low and stable inflation. Number two was long-term economic growth. Growth, and number three is low unemployment. Now don't forget the definition of uh, monetary policy is changing um, interest rates and uh, money supply and interest rates with the view of affecting aggregate demand to achieve economic objectives, namely inflation and unemployment. So one and three are the most important. Now number four and five um, don't require any diagram per se other than what you have here. So the business cycle just shows that even though there is a long run trend of upward or increased economic activity, real GDP tends to grow um, over the long term, at least since the Industrial Revolution. And um, what we do see is that our standard of living is usually higher than our parents, which is usually higher than their grandparents, our grandparents. But it is not a smooth line. And you see, the thing is, with this, there are peaks. Excuse me, there are troughs, expansions, recession. I did say troughs, excuse me, expansions, peaks and recessions and back. But the overall trend is upward sloping. But they cause a huge amount of difficulty. Yeah, we're all flying high during the peak, but a lot of people suffer badly during the, the trough. So what would be absolutely fantastic is if we could smooth out this business cycle. If we, really what would be desirable if we could get it down to this just line that year on year we're producing more, there's no, um, no bad, terrible recessions, troughs, and so on and so forth. That would be better. That would be more desirable because again, planning an economic 
economic calculation would be easier to do and also the ups and downs I mean their swings they, they, they have huge psychological stresses on people over a lifetime and it would be easier life would be better if we could just reduce that down all the way down to just an, an upward trend year on year it'd be fantastic so one of the goals of the central bank is to create the economic conditions necessary to foster long-term economic growth perfect we've already said that looking at the long-term trend line uh, we know that most economies do grow over time, particularly, you know, if there's respect for property rights, a, a free and fair rule of law, things like that, a, a culture of um, 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 uh, not breaking the law, respecting property rights, engaging in economic activity, not looking uh, to earn your money through criminal activities, all of that. So, but looking at the business cycle, we can see that this growth line is not always smooth. And long-run economic growth over time is a cycle of expansions, peaks, recessions, and troughs. And yes, I am repeating myself with the hope that it'll stick easier in your mind. And this fluctuation in the long-run trend causes great hardship and uncertainty for, uh, for those that must endure it. And one of the goals of monetary policy is to try to smooth out this business cycle in order to reduce the hardship for the residents of a nation or region. Okay, now finally this idea of balanced trade and again I don't really want to go into it too much yet because we'll be covering that in much greater detail in the final unit but an international trade balance occurs when a country's exports are equal to their imports that's what's called balanced trade All right? and, and at times you'll run what's called a surplus, a, ba a balance of trade um, a surplus on the current account, which is your exports are greater than your imports, and then a deficit on the current account, which is your exports are less than your imports. So over the long term, a country should desire a uh, balanced trade. Now, I won't explain why, I just want to deal with it now. It just means that there's... Um, Again, there's no um, swings and stuff like that. So you, a country can live uh, a much higher lifestyle than uh, what it produces if it imports a lot more. But that means that future production that happens in that economy, uh, economy has to be sent out in the form of, of exports. Um, so um, I've said that. So monetary policy can affect the value of a country's currency and as such the trade balance. Now for, uh, we've already looked at that, not how it does it, and we will look at that in the next unit, how it... Uh, monetary policy affects um, a currency's value and as such um, um, exports and imports but just for the moment I want you to know that monetary policy does affect a currency's value. We know that a contractual monetary policy causes interest rates to rise and so on and so forth and and the opposite is true as well. Guys, thank you so so much indeed. I hope that really helped. I, I'm sorry if I went on too long and I do hope to see you in the next video.